Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final session of this wonderful conference. We thank you for staying till the end. This is the exciting bit. We're coming to the end and this session on policy to practice. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our final keynote, Dr. John Foster. John is the CEO of Noah's Ark, a not-for-profit organization based in Southeast Australia and supports over 2,000 children and their families. John is a past national president of Early Childhood Intervention Australia and has been a member of many advisory bodies, including the Victorian State Disability Advisory Council and Victorian National Disability Insurance Scheme Implementation Task Force. John is also the co-author of the Key Worker Resources for Early Childhood Intervention Professionals, which influenced the introduction of the primary service provider model in Australia. He has written a book chapter on the development of services for children with a disability on, in Australia and contributed to many articles and reports. And I can keep adding to that, but I think we're all really keenly waiting to listen to John. Over to you, John. Good afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and any elders participating in this session. I've changed the talk that I was initially working on following the announcement of the review of the NDIS. I thought it was important to engage with that. The next 12 months is going to be a critical time for children with disabilities and their families. Over the next 12 months, the NDIS will be reviewed, the outcomes of the review will be decided, and we'll know whether the status quo continues or if there's change. Whatever is decided is likely to be with us for the next decade. So this means the outcomes of the review are going to affect everyone with an interest in young children, whether they're practitioners, researchers, people in government, service managers, and most importantly, families. In thinking about this review, the first issue will be to make sure that children get the attention they need. The NDIS is a huge venture. This means competing priorities. Many of the issues that the NDIS deals with have an urgency about them. For example, making sure people have housing. Young children who are cared for by their parents can be seen as needing less attention. This is a long-standing imbalance that we need to address. The second thing we need to do is change the conversation up. Since the beginning, the question seems to have been, how do children fit into the NDIS? For the review, we need to ask, is the NDIS a good fit for children? The question raises a difficult issue. What are our evaluation criteria? How do we decide what a good fit is? There are some lenses we can look through. We have a vision for what we're trying to achieve, and this is primarily documented through the Conventions on the Rights of the Child and the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have an accumulated knowledge about what best practices look like in, in supporting children with disabilities and their families. We don't have an agreed plan on how we support children in the community, which is problematic. And there is emerging information about challenge, the challenges of implementation of the NDIS funding model. So is the NDIS a good fit for children and families? Given the potential to, of the review to shape the future lives of young children and families, it's important that we look at it. The approach that I'm taking is influenced by cathedral thinking. So let's look at that. And I'm going to need a minute to hopefully do this. So cathedral thinking has emerged as an idea in architecture and is also used in different ways in the debate about the environment. At the core of cathedral thinking is the need to take the long view, to think of what is sustainable and to think of what can be built over time. Cathedrals were remarkable because when they were commissioned, it was understood that they may take up to a century to complete and that when completed, they would last for centuries. They were an investment for the future. To achieve these long-term projects, cathedral thinking needed a far-reaching vision, a well-thought-out blueprint and a shared commitment to implementation. So 
one of the modern examples of cathedral thinking is Antoni Gardi's Basilica of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. So here's a little excursion for a Friday afternoon. Gardi started designing his project in 1883 and worked through and on it until his death in 1926. At that stage, it was less than a quarter completed. It's an ambitious design which combines Gothic and Art Nouveau. The, ambitious, the building continued slowly with private donations and was stopped by the Spanish Civil War. Work slowly resumed in the 1950s. Modern technology, particularly computer-aided design, then increased the pace of the building. It reached the halfway mark by 2010. It was intended that it would be finished by 2025, but the pandemic has caused delays. While it's not universally liked, it is universally acclaimed for its scale and imagination, for its design and its innovation in finding solutions to the challenges of its construction. These all sound like good things to bring to a review of the NDIS. So the structure of this talk basically looks at cathedral thinking. Why is cathedral thinking important to us? Firstly, it reminds us to take the long view. Secondly, it provides a useful way of thinking about what needs to be put in place to have a successful outcome. The structure of this talk follows cathedral thinking in that it looks at, looks at vision, blueprint and implementation. The section on implementation is divided between the development of practices and the NDIS funding model. So why should we think about a timeline based on centuries? Cathedral thinking is important because it helps us understand the foundations that we build on and also that our decisions have long-term implications. As it also happens, the current vision for children with disability and its predecessor, the institutional vision, follow almost the same timeline as the building of the Basilica of the Sagrada Familia. The institutional vision of disability lasted from the 1880s to the 1960s. In the end, it was recognised as a mistake. From the 1960s, there was a human rights movement both in Australia and internationally to have people with disabilities out of institutions. For children, this meant being included with their family, in their community and alongside their peers. The change from institutional care started a series of practical responses. The 1970 Handicapped Children's Act introduced the first payment of subsidies to organisations to provide training and accommodation for children with disabilities. The 1974 Handicapped Child's Allowance was the first payment to a parent or guardian caring for a child likely to need constant care. At the same time, there was further discussions nationally and internationally about human rights. These finally resulted in the development of the international conventions on the rights of the child and the rights of persons with disabilities. So Australia has adopted a formal vision for children with disabilities through its ratification of both these conventions. Using the UN conventions at the basis of our far-reaching vision has been supported by government. The act that established the NDIS specifically refers to the NDIS as part of the government's commitment to a convention on the rights of persons with a disability. The act also acknowledges that the government has responsibilities under the conventions on the rights of the child. The vision for children therefore comes from both being part of the population of children and part of the population of people who have a disability. The early years learning framework also speaks to the experience of all young children. The first vision for children with disabilities was through the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The convention recognises the family as the fundamental group of society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members, particularly children. Children with disabilities are covered by the general provisions and some specific provisions covering disability. 
the specific provisions include that a mentally or physically disabled child should enjoy a full and decent life in conditions which ensure dignity, promote self-reliance, and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. A disabled child should receive special care and assistance, and a disabled child should be supported to achieve the fullest possible social integration and individual development. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was created to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities. In sections specifically relating to children, governments who are signatories under the Convention are expected to ensure that children enjoy the, the same benefits as all others in terms of human rights and fundamental freedoms, act in the best interests of the child, ensure that child, children with disabilities have the right to express their views freely, access an inclusive education, and provide the support required to facilitate an effective education. The final framework that I want to touch on is the uh, early years learning framework. And it now covers all early childhood services through the National Quality Framework. And this framework requires services to promote the following outcomes. Children have a strong sense of identity. Children are connected with and contribute to their world. Children have a strong sense of well-being. Children are confident and involved learners. And children are effective communicators. Given these three frameworks are all recognised by governments, they can contain con significant commitments to children and a basis for considering if the NDIS is a good fit for children and families. So the second component of cathedral thinking is a blueprint. The name blueprint derives from copying of plans for a building. These plans were then given to everybody responsible for the different components of the construction. It meant people that were working towards the same end. Unfortunately, this hasn't been the experience for children with disabilities. The lack of a plan about what we're trying to achieve has made it difficult to progress, and it's still a problem. The main mechanisms for developing a national approach in disabilities has been through the national, state and territory disability plans. The focus of these plans has been almost exclusively on issues faced by adults with disabilities. They propose changes in such areas as accessibility, mobility, housing, health, wellbeing, safety, education, and skills and employment. These plans did not address the issue faced by children in families, except in references in education. This has finally been addressed in the most recent Australia's Disability Strategy 2021-2031, which includes an early childhood targeted action plan. The absence of young children from these plans is not unusual. Early childhood is not done well generally in terms of the development of plans. One explanation is there remains tensions between what is a family's responsibility and the role of government. For example, different philosophies have been evident in debates about childcare. Is it providing child minding for working adults or is it supporting children's learning and development? The early years learning framework took a century to be agreed on given preschools were first introduced in Australia in the early 1900s. In the absence of a national approach, the state and territory governments proceeded to fund services for young children with disabilities on an ad hoc basis. Each state and territory government adopted its own approach. In all states and territories, services were provided directly through government departments. Some government organisations were also commissioned to provide services, primarily in New South Wales and Victoria. Services for children with disabilities were kept separate from other services for children. Services were managed through a range of different department arrangements. This contributed to different types of services in different parts of the country. The guidelines for these services are the main indicators of their purpose. Prior to the introduction of the NDIS, and the ending of these services, 
their guidelines generally supported children's rights and the role of families in supporting children. For example, the New South Wales ageing, disability and home care's approach was that every child, regardless of their needs, has the right to fully participate in their community and have the same choices and opportunities and experiences as other children. Victoria and Tasmania's education department programs provided parents and families with knowledge, skills and support to meet the needs of their child to optimise the child's development and to support the particip participation in family and community life. The West Australian Disability Commission described its services as using a family-centred approach, which recognises that every family is unique. In 2008, the Australian government became involved. Rather than playing a coordinating role and initiating a national planning progress, process, the Commonwealth took its own ad hoc decision to become an additional service provider. Its services were explained as supplementary to those provided by the state. The new programs had a very different focus. The Helping Children with Autism and Better Start programs were described as providing grants for the purchase of professional, therapeutic and educational services for a child with a specific diagnosis of disability. This approach can now be seen as a precursor to the introduction of the NDIS. The ad hoc approach that has characterised the development of services for children in, dis in Australia has contributed to different understandings in different regions. The NDIS has been implemented on top of these differences. A process to reconcile the different approaches is yet to occur. This makes it harder to agree, agree on how to progress the vision for children with disabilities or what success or otherwise looks like for the NDIS. The third and final component of cathedral thinking is implementation. There are two components of implementation that are particularly relevant to the NDIS review. The first is the emergence of best practices, and the second is looking at what we can learn from the NDIS through the impact of its implementation to date. After the agreement on a vision, the identification of best practices represents the most important progress. The best practices developed from the interests of the professionals who started working in the early services for children with disabilities. That group of professionals were pioneers. For 80 years or four generations, children with disabilities were excluded from the community. Working out how to support children with disabilities in the community was new. There was an early commitment to using research to inform practice. As with the development of the vision, the progress on, on the development of best practices in Australia was linked to international developments. The primary driver of research on children with disabilities came from the USA. They started in the early 1960s through the Kennedy administration. Leaders in this field have included Michael Gorelnik and Carl Dunst. They, along with their colleagues, have continued to research and develop family systems models for supporting the development of children with disabilities over the last 50 years. These have come to combine a therapeutic understanding of what might help a child with a developmental disability with an understanding of the most effective ways to support a child's learning and development. While the streams of research into child development and children with disability began separately, they have converged over time. There have been significant advances in the scientific research into how children develop. President Clinton sponsored the National Research Council in the US to undertake a major report from Neurons to Neighbourhoods, the Sciences of Early Childhood Development in 2000. This, synthes this synthesised the growing research on early development across many scientific fields. This report and other work at the time contributed to international interest in the importance of all children attending early years services. One outcome of that interest was the early years learning framework. In the lead up to the NDIS, Early Childhood Intervention was a convention, Intervention Australia was commissioned to identify the best practices that support effective early intervention. 
This report was a combination of a consultation with early childhood intervention practitioners and drew on the decades of research into the development of young children and young children with disabilities. It themed the practices into four years, family inclusion, teamwork and universal principles. It went on to identify eight practices. I'm going to assume everyone at this conference is familiar with these practices. These practices are informed by what research indicates are the most effective ways to work with children with disabilities. They have not been universally adopted. One of the reasons is that by design, these practices are community-based and largely occur in families' homes and other places children spend time. Other models of service have continued to be provided from a centre that families bring their child to, including in hospitals. The practices have been endorsed by the NDIA and the NDIS. They have an important role in considering if the NDIS is a good fit for children. So the final area that I want to consider is what we have learned so far from the implementation of the NDIS. I will look at this in relation to the quality areas. The first one is to do with families and is the NDIS bad for family health? There's growing information that the NDIS is bad for the health or well-being of families and carers looking after children. The table I'm showing you comes from the NDIA 2021 report on outcomes for families and children. It shows us that for each year, the parents of children aged birth to 14 year old years are involved with the NDIS. Their rating of their health declines. They have declining, they have a declining number of people they can ask for practical help. And there's no change in the number of people from whom they can ask for emotional support. The table of parents' ratings of their health show ratings year by year they're in the program. The baseline data comes from 2017. Between 2017 and 2021, families' rating of their health declined by 13.3%. What's concerning is these results correspond to the findings of the initial evaluation of the NDIS completed by Flinders University in 2018. That evaluation found that while the NDIS led to some improvement in the well-being of participants, there was no improvement in the well-being of families and carers generally, and it had a negative impact on the well-being of those caring for children. This reporting must raise questions about the types of services that families are receiving. Our colleague Anu Bopti found in a 2020 study the families receiving early intervention services based on best practices, practices had scores, higher scores in relation to the quality of quality of life. Factors that were important included family-centered practices, a positive or strength-based approach, and information and support. There may be more critical structural issues. Can an individualized funding model that doesn't recognize the family unit work for families? There's a lot to explore here. Regardless of the explanation, this is not a good result for the rapidly increased, given the rapidly increasing funding packages experienced by children aged birth to 14 years since 2016. It's not a good result either, given the extended time parents need to, to support their child. Secondly, in terms of inclusion, the model of funding through the NDIS supports the broad principles of participation. NDIS funding can support greater community involvement, which is a good thing. Whether a service has this focus or not rests with the family and service. The NDIA has some limited data on communication, community participation in its surveys. The main finding is that over time, parents want their children to be more involved in community activities. This is for children from birth to before they start school. There are some positive changes reported by families in terms of inclusion in places like churches and other community settings. What the best practices highlight is the importance of the inclusion of inclusion to children's development. 
And the current NDIS funding model appears to have two limitations. The first is that while parents want their child to be more involved, the individualised funding model doesn't support collective action to improve children's participation in the community more generally. The responsibility to negotiate access to activities, whether they're sport, art or games, rests with individual parents or workers, making representation on behalf of an individual child. A child's opportunities are influenced by their parents' networks and capacity to undertake such negotiations. The bigger problem is that the two main places children live are at home and in children's services, such as preschools and schools. These are now split between the Commonwealth, NDIS and state-run early childhood and school services. In the introduction to the NDIS, the two levels of government committed to working closely together at the local level to plan coordinated streamlined services for individuals requiring both school education and disability services. But is this possible? The NDIS market model means there are no clear expectations about how NDIS funded services should interact with children's services or schools. Schools, or, schools also make their own decisions. The result is one of three interactions between services. These interactions are no interaction, a service based on withdrawing the child from their activities, or a level of cooperation. The worst case scenarios we hear about include disconnects so severe that a child has one behaviour support program for school and a different one for at home. Another child has one communication device at school and a different one funded by the NDIS at home. This type of situation compromises the child's development and should never occur. We don't understand the scale of the issues here because there simply isn't the information to, to look at it. In relation to teamwork, the NDIS in general is creating problems. Hamel and her colleagues in a 2022 report have looked at, looked at some of the challenges arising from the way the NDIS encourages, encourages participants to have multiple providers at an adult level. It identifies that it's, this is leading organisations to have to find ways of coordinating for individuals at the local level. The anecdotal information is that families with young children are now using multiple and disconnected services which doesn't support teamwork. And finally, I wanted to finish with a comment about workforce. Best practice needs a stable and sustainable workforce. To be effective, the professionals working with young children with disabilities need to be highly skilled. This can only occur if staff receive training and accumulate skills over time. This requires a stable workforce. Since the introduction of the NDIS, the workforce continues to experience high levels of workforce shortages and turnover. In its 1921 report, NDS reported that the top four hardest occupational groups to recruit into the NDIS were therapists. Over 90% of surveyed organisations reported difficulties recruiting speech therapists and occupational therapists. Over 60% of organisations had difficulties retaining speech therapists, occupational therapists and psychologists. The large increase in the demand for therapists was entirely predictable with the introduction of the NDIS and its increased funding levels. This has been further impacted by COVID-19. There remains no NDIA-initiated response. The NDIA 2021 Workforce Plan barely raises the issue and does not comment specifically on the situation for children, although there is a child on the cover. The current situation means services are unavailable, the quality of services cannot be sustained, and the viability of services under pressure. In all, this is a very difficult situation. So in conclusion, let me briefly recap the next 12 months are a critical time for people interested in the futures of children with disabilities. Whatever comes from the view of the NDIS will be significant. We need to change the conversation, 
instead of asking how children fit into the NDIS, we need to ask, is the NDIS a good fit for children? In making observations, the observations I have about the NDIS, I'm wanting to look at structural issues that could be repaired. The fact that we have an NDIS is unquestionably a great achievement. I haven't tried to list everything that's right or wrong. What I've tried to do is identify things that we have in place, like an agreed vision, best practices. And we now have a growing understanding of what the operational outcomes of the NDIS model is. We still don't have an agreed plan. There is another perhaps more fundamental problem. Who is representing the best interests of the child in all of the decisions that will be made about them? If children's interests aren't represented, they are invisible in the decision-making process. Without representation, there's no recognition. Without recognition, there's no action. The disability advocacy groups are strong in their call for nothing about us without us. Minister Shorten made a point in appointing additional people with lived experience onto the board of the NDIA. The members of the board with lived experience represent adults' experiences. Children and their families are not represented on the board. Nearly half the participants in the NDIA are children. Why don't they have proportionate representation? Another example is there is no one with a professional background in early childhood disability appointed to the panel reviewing the NDIS. Early childhood disability is a specific area of expertise. Most people who join the NDIS in the future will be children. Making sure the panel has the expertise to design the best entry is in the interests of the NDIS. I recently joined some colleagues in writing to the minister asking for the appointment of somebody with early childhood disability onto the panel. As the review gets underway, I'm sure there'll be many opportunities to contribute ideas to how the NDIS might improve. Pracy will have a place for it on its website so people can get updates. I hope cathedral thinking has added to your ways of looking at the NDIS. I hope it's certainly added to your sense of the long view and the long process of development that we're going through. I'll make the ver a full version of this paper available soon. I'm sure you all have a valuable contribution to make. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the conference and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, John. Oh, how inspiring is that? So often, um, for any conference that I go to from the keynotes, I always try to get one or two pearls of wisdom. And of course, the cathedral thinking is one that I'm going to take with me, John. So thank you for that. There's a lot of discussion in the discussion forum. Not a lot of them are question and answers, but I think they're really good points to bring up here now. Um, if people don't mind even putting up some in the Q&A, that would be good. But I think there are mostly comments around how this work with the workforce is its really an issue. And also there's um, a question around COVID and the impact of COVID on um, families and whether that's being re researched. Um, and I'll just go through some of that discussion, John, just to see. Um, yep, so there's comments on the provider market being influenced by availability of NDIS funding. And there was another one. Um, around yeah lots of different impacts on children and families in the world so um would you just want to make a comment on the workforce john to start off the discussion um yeah thanks Mu. i think um the workforce issue is uh really critical and andrew referred to that yesterday um we we're in a a, a very difficult situation in terms of shortages of um, therapists ac across uh, all of the different therapies, really. And so what that is doing um, is, I think, creating real uh, pressures in terms of lots of movement in terms of therapists and 
people coming into the field and a, a really strong need then for training new people coming in and um, trying to keep that up, keep up with that's difficult. If we don't keep up with that, then um, ultimately it challenges the availability of services because there's, there simply aren't enough staff and it challenges the quality of services because um, people haven't got the training that they need. And I, I think of early intervention as being a, a complex role and so I think this sort of the the the, the, you know, the good part of it is that the NDIS has provided all of this additional funding, and I think that's uh, helpful, uh, very helpful. But uh, trying to then find the balance in terms of a workforce which can provide the services that people need um, is is a big challenge. Thanks, John. Um, there's another question. Do you think family-centred practice can survive the NDIS given the way it has eroded in the past five years? I think that this is one of the big challenges that we really need to take to the review. And uh, I, I think that there's a... Um, the the NDIA was um, founded by a range of different people using different who had different priorities. So some of the people who were driving it were people like Rhonda Galbally, who spoke to us yesterday and who is passionately interested in, in family-centred practice and in families in general. And then we've got this mechanism of creating a, a market around individualised funding, which... I still would argue was set up to meet the needs of adults for whom the scheme was really uh, originally um, designed. That was that was when when this was being thought out at the beginning. That's who they were looking at. And uh, children, in my experience, came into it late. So I was involved on uh, in Victoria on the NDIS Implementation Task Force. I joined that task force a year after everybody else when I got appointed by, from, by the Minister for Children because nobody was representing children. Uh, and so we were very much a, a second stage. And I, I think that uh, the work hasn't yet been done to fully work out how do these sorts of mechanisms, uh, how, does, how does this market approach uh, work for children, and and I think some of the things I was trying to touch on, in terms of the the different practice areas, uh, is is trying to get it, to get into that. And I'm not saying that I've got the answer, but I think these are the sorts of conversations that we need to be had having in terms of, well, you know, we what what little information I could find is saying, well, we've got a problem with families. We've got a problem with family centred practice. Uh, we we know that from a practitioner point of view in terms of some of the priorities that it's pushing us in terms of families being worried about money and being worried about what they're buying. Uh, what's the consequence of that, I guess, is what I was trying to get to there. And and what it's showing is, well, it's it's actually not, not, not working well. Um, it may be on the surface, but underneath it's not. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, perhaps another question. Um, I think it's kind of related, but in a different way. Do you believe that reversing the standard funding packages as we had previously in ECUS and HECWA that seizes at age seven is the way to go? Do we have data comparing previous models to this one? In terms of, can you tell me a bit more about that question, Anu? Um, I think that's a question from um, Jamie, is it? Um, yeah, I I would imagine, Jamie, did, um, if you can clarify, I would imagine if there's any comparative data of pre-NDIS, post-NDIS is what they're asking about, whether um, in terms of service provision, I mean, that's what I would gather, reversing packages, because ECIS and HECWA were age seven and NDIS is doesn't have an age. So I'm, I'm assuming that's what it is, but I'll wait for them to reply. We'll go on to the next question. Do you think it is a failure on the NDIA to recognize parents as valuable reps of their children, or do we need to do 
more advocacy as professionals to raise their voice or what's the solution here to raise the voice of children and parents in the NDIS review? I think that we definitely need to be raising the voice of families. I think uh, there's a real problem in terms of the representation of families and, and that's professional representation as well as direct representation by families through all of the structures. And I think there's a problem with trying to set up a system which is basically treats everybody from birth to uh, 65 in the same way. And I think that's part of the, the, the kind of clash that we're working with in terms of what we're looking for as a as very tailored outcomes for different ages and the way the scheme has been operating is, is trying to keep them all uh, had the same mechanism to deal with, with them all. And I think it's that mechanism which is causing these sorts of problems. I think there's arguments about whether you have a different type of service for children before they reach school. So whether you uh, look look very, look differently. But, but I mean, the longer I look at it, I think it's actually about children in total that's, that uh, we, we've got a, a problem in. And I think the... the there is in, in the uh, Act, what the Act talks about families and carers as someone who does something for or acts on behalf of others. There's, there's actually no recognition of the caring role in, in terms of the Act or the construction of the, the funding. And I think that's where the, the fundamental problem comes from. Thanks, John. I'm just going to have a quick look at some other questions and try and getting them into one. So they're quite related to NDIS and NDIA. Do you think that the data on family well-being is also reflective of the way availability of NDIS funding has influenced the provider market? Well, I think the the whole language around um, that, that, that what you're buying is therapy support um, is is problematic in terms of guiding people to think that's what's important. I mean, one of the things which I think we need to reflect on is that previously services for children with young uh, for young children was it was run through both an education and a health lens. So we thought about you know teachers were much more involved. It had much more of a developmental focus from that angle as well as having a therapeutic focus. And one of the things which has happened in this is it's become gone much more to the therapeutic focus. And, and I think we, if you have a funding system which says, well, what we're funding is therapy, then people think we should go and buy therapy. Yep, thanks, John. Um, I think we, I'm just going to watch the time and there's one more question, but also I'll pick up something from the discussion, John. There's a bit of discussion around helping people from um, Ukraine or other countries and because we are also looking at what's happening in that space. So would you kind of comment? I know that we've got speakers from Ukraine, India and internationally. And just for the benefit of all of them, is there anything that you could comment on in terms of um, collaborating research and practice? Well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really um, important that we do what we can contribute. And I think one of the things I'm always conscious of when I'm uh, talking about the NDIS and we're being critical of the NDIS is that when you talk internationally and say, well, the problem is we've got all this money and we don't have the staff to spend it on. Um, mm. That's a problem that most other countries think, well, that would be nice if we were in that position. So we've got this very generous contribution. I think um, we do need to do what we can as a, a sector in terms of collaborating with other countries. Um, previously, we've run a, 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 a Asia-Pacific conference and maybe that's something we can build towards in the future again where we really try and build those relationships particularly with those countries which are, are near us. Thanks John. 
I'm just going to pause for a bit if um, and see if there's anything else that there's a last question about the hourly rate. Do you think that the NDI hourly rate versus pay rate organizations are willing to pay is a contributing factor to recruiting therapists apart from the shortage? <laughs> um, I, it, it, it probably ultimately is, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's the problem. Sorry about that. Um, I think the... Uh, you know, I, th I think the shortage is really the issue that we need to be addressing. Um, and we um, need to really try and work out how we're going to do that. And I th so I think that's that's the bigger issue. I think the, the main thing that I think that I'm trying to get to in, the, in this presentation is that, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up in mm. the busyness of the NDIS and... Um, we really need to also be, be putting time into these sort of structural issues and thinking about, well, what are the things that we need to really focus on to get changed through the review? Um, and and I think that um, these are the, the sort of the big issues are uh, what's, what's happening in terms of the system supporting best practices and, and enabling best practices, and that's what we need to be addressing. Yes, I think that's what I was listening to. Um, and some of the things you talked about was the absence of young children in disabilities and um, most of the blueprint for children with disabilities um, in that section when you talked about, you know, disability doesn't recognize children. And so we need to keep looking at those regulations as well. Another thing that really intrigued me, John, was when you said this, since 50 years, we've been um, having the models for family partnerships and relationships. Um, and we're still um, here trying to, you know, get our research going in the family space. So that was another point for me to ponder and share. And maybe that can um, spark some questions. I know that we've got a little bit of time. And I think you, when you put out the best practices that um, according to the guidelines, um, we do need to pick those up for further research as well. Um, just Yeah, absolutely. Up. And my point would be that they've been evolving for 50 years. They, I mean, I think uh, when, we, when people started, they would just try everything. And the organisation that I work for, Noah's Ark, started 50 years ago and we were celebrating the 50th anniversary and people were just, and it was a lot of family involvement and they were just trying everything because nobody uh, knew how to do this. Um, but we have had 50 years of research and we've had 50 mm -hmm. years of research, not only in disability, but also in child development. So we've got very a, di a very different um situation but i think the, the the blueprint that i thing is that we we don't have government agreement and so we've got all of our different governments have headed off in different directions and the commonwealth government headed off in its own direction without engaging with the other governments at a policy level and and that's a big challenge um because in terms of setting setting the chart the, the direction going forward in terms of the review providing the, the uh, direction going forward, then we do need uh, governments to, to be getting behind that. And there were some wonderful presentations through the um, whole day today on co-design and in, including parents and children in co-design. I, I was fortunate to listen to a few of them. So I think just being mindful of that as well, because I, I heard you saying People are mindful of including families in the NDIS, but also having that voice in research would be something. I think there's a lot of work already going on. So the cathedral still going, John. Yeah, and absolutely. And it's meant to be an image which is about, you know, how do we keep building? And, and it's certainly an image which is that um, we, you know, this, this, we're only part of the way there in terms mm. of delivering the vision. And I think part of what I'm hoping people will think about is going back to that vision and saying, well, well, what, how do we keep developing that? And, and the NDIS is only part of that. Um, there, there are other aspects in, in education, in the community um, and in families which, which stretch beyond what, what the NDIS does. 
And I think sometimes it's uh, easy to get consumed by the NDIs. Um, mm. And we, we need to make sure we don't do that. Yeah, 100% agree. And um, this question from Sue, um, does family-centered practice need to be measured as a quality indicator? I Before you comment, I just feel like the family is part of um, disability throughout their journey. So I just don't never know how that didn't happen. But anyway, over to you. Does it need to be measured as a quality indicator? Well, I think, I think um, and I, I'm, I'm not the technical expert to say how, but I think we need to be really conscious of family quality of life, that that needs to be one of the, the main goals coming out of the vision is if children are going to live in the community and their families and and then that's the foundation because it's from the, the their families that they, they get both the early development but also the chance to go out into the community, the connections to schools and so forth, or to, to children's services. And, and if, if families aren't doing well, um, then children aren't going to do as well. So that's that to me is the critical issue. Yes, I couldn't agree more on that one. Um, and I, I do think, because all my work has been in family quality of life, John, and it's it doesn't finish. So the family's quality of life around the person with the disability is is never singular. It's always, um, you know, you can never forget the unit around the person. Okay. Um, I might pause there now and probably um, invite Denise back into... The room. Thanks, John. Before we go, can we just thank John for a wonderful um, end to the conference and the keynote, John? So lots to think about, but that's what the cathedral thinking that you're leaving us with. So thank you very much, John. Thanks, Anu. Hi, everybody. Well, what a great discussion to um, finalise the conference. And we got to the end of it successfully. So thank you all for your participation and interaction throughout the conference. It's been terrific to see the chat in the discussion forum and the live chat. Um, well, I've received some of the feedback and based on that, um, it looks like you agree with me that we've had one and a half days of high quality keynote speakers, concurrent sessions and posters on a wide range of topics. It's been really refreshing to be able to have um, these conversations about. So there's definitely been something for everyone. I'm sure you'll also have taken away many key points to reflect on to extend and enhance um, practice. And it's also highlighted some key questions. We need researchers to answer. In fact, there's a very long list uh, done in collaboration with families and practitioners. Um, I also love some of the feedback uh, provided that the information was going to be shared with teams to support discussion within organisations. So um, I'd also encourage you to look at um, the Pracy website at the research snapshots, um, as these would also support discussion within your teams or within your organisation. We do understand that not all questions were able to be answered by the keynotes, so we will endeavour to get responses for you. But in relation to the concurrent session uh, questions, I'd encourage you to reach out to the presenters. I'm sure they would appreciate having the opportunity to answer your questions. So thanks again uh, to our keynotes, to our concurrent session uh, presenters and the poster sessions. Without you, there wouldn't have uh, been a, a conference. Um, as I mentioned at the conference opening, it was great to have an international audience joining us and sharing their knowledge and expertise. Um, and we've enjoyed having you with us. As people have noted, unfortunately, our colleague Oksana was unable to attend due to electricity loss because of current attacks in Odessa. And I think everyone will join with me in, in hoping for peace in Ukraine in the very near future with recognition of challenges for a variety of countries um, from many different perspectives. Um, so thank you once again to our sponsors and exhibitors. 
We greatly appreciated your support and look forward to working with you in the future. So Western Sydney University, Mission Australia, NOAA's Art Training, Cerebral Palsy Alliance, Interreach and Everyday Independence and um, Plum Tree. Thank you again. I would also like to reiterate my thanks to the Pracy Conference Committee and the Pracy Full Committee for supporting the chairing and providing valuable input into the proceedings. This has definitely been a collaborative team approach. And I must add a big thanks to Megan Fox for getting the website ready to go um, live yesterday. I'd also like to thank DC Conferences for supporting us as a new organisation and being optimistic about our ability to provide a high quality program that would attract participants. The work that went on in the background by the highly polished IT team was amazing. Thank you very much. Um, however, I think there is something we all agree on um, that our preference is for face-to-face -face conferences. So on that note, I'd like to announce that the second Pracy Conference will be held on the Gold Coast in May 2024, second to fourth uh, at this stage, although that is uh, a little tentative. So please put it in your diary and you've got nearly two years to be a part of the program and we look forward to, to seeing you there. But if you would like to contact us, use the website or via the email that's on the slide, we would encourage you to share the website and email so we can reach as many individuals working in the field as possible, whether from a research or practice perspective. And we will definitely keep you up to date with the resources that we develop training opportunities, communities of practice and other projects being undertaken by Pracy. And look, contact us if you'd like to be involved or even have a request of us. We're very keen to share research findings and collaborate with others to achieve the goals of Pracy as an organisation. So I'm going to say thank you until next time, but I'm also going to invite all of the Pracy committee onto the main stage so we can Brady Bunch <laughs> the, uh, the final uh, farewell and once again say a huge thank you uh, to everybody who has participated and have a great night until we see you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks for the support. Well done, everyone. Yeah.